Hey everybody, this is Dan. And this is Ron. And we're back with uh, a nominee questionable movies. We just finished watching Samuel Fuller's 1964. I called it a neo-noir. I don't know what genre to put this in after watching it again, um, but Samuel Fuller wrote and directed it, and it was released in 1964, and it was produced in the United States. It's a singular film. This was the, I thought this was the blockbuster hit of the 1964 summer season. Or was this more like Oscar bait? Like came out last weeks of December, only in LA and New York. I mean, I kind of feel like this was probably only released to drive-ins. <laughs> right like there was a certain class of movies that would make it to actual theaters and then there was a class of movies where because like that was the easiest way to independently distribute things was to drive-ins oh okay because drive-ins <laughs> tended to be independently operated more often than like movie theaters proper oh interesting hmm. um like that's actually a uh, cassavetti some of his movies were uh was it? opening night which only ran for a week in two cities and then was basically a lost film for 25 years Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure one of the like three movie theaters it ran in was a drive-in because mm -hmm. that was you know and like monster movies like a lot yeah. of those classic 50s monster movies that are I mean classic in the sense that they're old not classic in the sense that they're any good but the drive-in theaters were this sort of like secondary independent distribution chain yeah yeah the um yeah this movie had a had a feel of it the the production values were more in par with the the juvenile delinquency uh, movies yeah it felt like i mean parts of it feel like a roger corman movie yeah. except it's like completely earnest mm. right like i never got the sense in the well i i guess we should go over the plot first yeah okay yeah what's the movie about and and i guess to anyone who wants to watch i would highly recommend this if you if you're a fan of like weird movies this is a, an absolute must see because they don't get and it, it's like weird how it is weird i guess like the, the closest thing i can think of is like kiss me deadly anyway i'm getting off track so constance towers plays kelly who is a a uh, prostitute. She's living in one town. Uh, the movie begins with her completely bald, beating the shit out of her pimp with, I think, like a brick in a in a handbag or something. Like, or no, no, no. I think she, it's just her fists. Like, she has some kind of combat training because it's not the first time that we see her just like beat the shit out of somebody in this movie. Mm -hmm. It's or like not the only time. Her move. It's the first time, but not the only time. The first time, yeah. And it's like a pretty shocking opening to a movie, especially one that was released in 1964. Right. The best part of that opening was the opening credits because you see her because she's totally bald and then she fixes after she's done beating the guy up she's putting the wig on her head and adjusting it and then making all these funny faces um so uh, while while the opening credits are rolling over her face or getting displayed over her face yeah so she she moves to this new town and she tries to pick up a john on her own and does so successfully with some of the most awkward sex euphemisms in the cinema like she has three bottles of champagne in this briefcase she's carrying she just opens up the briefcase on a public park bench and I mean, God, I wish I could remember the lines like verbatim because Samuel Fuller has this incredibly bizarre relationship to human speech and particularly <laughs> to euphemisms that's like, it's better than if he was trying to make it sound convincing or realistic because it, it's so singular. Uh -huh. I think like there's a lot of parts of this movie where I, you legitimately can't tell if like this is good bad like and if it was better in some capacity would it be actually be worse as a totality but anyway so she she goes to this town she picks up a john she sleeps over at his place it turns out he's the only police officer in the town his name is griff and then she gets a job working at an orthopedic hospital with no medical training or credentials um and Griff kind of acts very gruff a lot of the time because he's afraid that her like connections to prostitution are going to corrupt something or other. 
Um, Griff happens to be friends with this incredibly rich man named Grant, uh, who's like this big philanthropist, and he's like building hospitals left and right. And the town is called Grantville. Yeah, and she uh, she begins a romantic relationship with Grant. Um, they both love old poetry and old poetry, I guess. Um, you know, and he's certainly like this very suave individual, probably compared to the people she was used to dealing with. Um, and also one of her like fellow nurses aide people at the orthopedic hospital um, goes over to the local brothel um, and she's like, oh man, I got 25 bucks in your dress and they're telling me I can make $300 a week doing this, that, or the other thing. And Kelly beats the crap out of her to stop her from hooking. Um, wait, wait, she beats the crap out of the, the madam. Did she beat the crap out of the... The woman as well? The woman who was... I mean, at the very her. least, she, like, slapped her. Yeah, yeah, okay, I think she slapped her. And then they're on the bed, and she's like, you'll hate all men, you'll hate yourself, mm -hmm. they'll give you extra tips when the block of ice you've become melts a little bit or something, you know? Yeah, it's there's so some... hard-boiled. Yeah, that language is in there. There's, there's some pretty interesting language. Like, suddenly, out of the blue, these lines will come out that are just a totally different caliber. <laughs> yeah, and the, the rest of the dialogue. Like extended you, because like for half the movie, they're referring to prostitutes as bonbons, and you're like, okay, it's 1964, censors, sure, you know, we're, we're going to call them bonbons. And then they just outright say prostitution. Yeah, yeah. It, it's sort of like he gets sick of it at a certain point, and then he's just like calling it. The or he's the sin. Did. He's the sin, and then he said, fuck the code. Right. Yeah. And yeah, so she does that. She also like beats the crap out of the man at the brothel, um, where for some reason, the like for the first solid first half of the movie, the only context we ever see this police officer in is him picking up hookers. <laughs> except for like he's at grant's birthday party at one point but beyond that like we see him at the brothel we're first introduced to him as like a guy who's willing to pay 10 bucks to have sex with some lady that just showed up on a bus with three bottles of champagne right <laughs> anyway so she uh you know, she has the, oh, and she rents a room from this nice old lady whose husband never came back from World War II. And this old lady has been keeping a, uh, a mannequin in the up, upstairs of her house representing her dead husband for 20 or yeah, it would have been about 20 years at that point. Yeah, he's wearing, a, the, the mannequin has uh, a military uniform and, um, and a hat. Yeah, and she starts talking. She makes very quick friends with the uh, the mannequin. You know, all the kids at the hospital love her. You know, she's like suddenly the hit, the huge hit in this town. She's and uh, but she's afraid that her past is is going to catch up to her. So she comes clean to Grant and says like. Hey, I used to be a prostitute. Um, you know, I don't want to screw up your philanthropic activities with my dark past. And for some reason, and I, I think Fuller was actually like doing something pretty, pretty tricky here, right? Because like when Grant hears like, "Oh, you, uh, Kelly used to be a prostitute," he's like, "Marry me." Yeah. Um, who, who could not be able It's like, oh, he's got a heart of gold because he's like running these children's hospitals and he just like has this soft spot for, you, okay. know, you know, people in, in rough situations, of course, later on. Um, and in, at the point where the movie abruptly almost turns into a completely different movie, uh, we find out that Grant is a child molester and he wants to marry Kelly because he sees her as being similarly morally compromised. Doesn't and then she literally beats him to death with a telephone. <laughs> At which point the rest of the movie is like her dealing with the police to prove that Grant was in fact a child molester. Right, because they think the police, meaning Griff, mm. um, who's interrogating her, 
uh, is convinced that he uh, that Grant broke off broke off the uh, broke off the wedding or postponed the wedding, um, and that that's why she she got mad at him and killed him. Right, and Griff is never seen. I think my favorite because there's a lot of lines in here where you can tell they're just like justifying the fact that this thing had literally no budget. Uh-huh. Early on, I think I think Kelly's talking to Griff and she's like, "Why aren't you in uniform?" And he's like, "Everybody around here knows me." It's because they couldn't afford a police costume. <laughs> I'm like 100% sure cuz you never see him in one. You don't see a gun either, I don't think, do you? Huh? Is I don't think you see a gun. He's not wearing a gun, is he? I don't recall seeing. Yeah, there's no there's no guns in this movie. Like people go bare knuckle or nothing yeah yeah um the the closest thing we see to a gun is that like old telephone that kelly uses to beat grant to death right 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 (laughs) um yeah and that's when the movie turns it's suddenly um there's uh the dialogue changes the whole tone changes and there's a much better use of uh light and shadows Mm. like everything the composition of and the yeah, everything about the right, movie. It goes into like full yeah. noir territory from yeah. like the first half of the movie. I don't even know what genre you would call that. It's it's only the last 20 minutes that are film noir. Everything happens in the last 20 minutes. Yeah. I mean, in, I mean, he is setting up the last 20 minutes in the first half, but the ways that he's setting it up are so, God, like they're, oh, what is it? She She like looks at Griff the first night that they meet and she like, like some of the euphemisms I got, the one that I literally, I still have no idea what the fuck she was talking about, but it gets referenced twice in the movie. She like makes bedroom eyes at him and, you know, I'm not, Constance Towers has a much better like sultry bedroom voice than I do. But she's like, I never make change when he like tries to like pay her $10. Yeah. And it's like not making change is... I don't know if that was like a sex act in the 60s. I wasn't there. You know, I'm in that like rare category of don't remember it and I wasn't there. (laughs) Well... Uh, also, she's 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 not cheap, right? That's true. Yeah, I guess you maybe have to pay full price for her. Yeah, but also the notion is so she doesn't make change and she doesn't change. Mm, right, she- and then there's also these like there's a lot of references in the screenplay to faking it till you make it, right? Like she's huh. she's telling that story to the kids in the orphanage about like making believe that she was playing with little Billy or something, and then little Billy showed up and. Huh. Um, and like the film as a whole has this like weird fake it till you make it vibe because it's, I I mentioned to Ron when we were watching it, like, I think the thing that I love about Samuel Fuller's movies is that he's clearly, he's a guy with a lot on his mind. He has very strange ideas about how the world works. (laughs) That weirdness comes through in the movies, but you never get the sense that he thinks any of this is weird like you you get the very clear sense he's trying to communicate like as directly and forcefully as possible and so Mm -hmm. you get that whatever tone comes out of the contrast of those two things and yeah Mm -hmm. so eventually the town figures out that grant is a child molester and we're left with an ambiguous ending of her walking away from a crowd and then a bus shows up yeah no i mean it's 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 clear that she's leaving town Right. Yeah, that seems to be the implication. We don't see her get on the bus, but there's no other real reason. But then there's also like she kisses Griff on the lips like they were and they like refer to each other like they were dating. Uh-huh. Yeah. So yeah. A lot of loose ends. As if they had some sort of bond the whole time. Which... Right. When like the rest of the movie is just Griff being a dick to her about being a prostitute in yeah. her previous life. I mean, there might be some sort of trope there that it's playing with, but it's or it's it's not doing a very good job because it's like, yeah, at some point the hooker and the cop are supposed to get together, or the 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 other guy, the first guy, has been the right guy all along, but it's never meant to be, or I don't know. There's some trope in there somewhere, but it's yeah, supposed to be uh, uh, it's supposed to be fleshed out more, and it's not fleshed out at all. It just suddenly shows up. And there's a lot of things like that, and and I I think I'm making the movie sound a lot more a lot less strange seeming than it is when you're actually watching it. Like I'm, I'm glossing over like a bunch of weird little detour. Like at one point 
uh, Kelly like slaps a lady and then forces her like pays her a thousand dollars not to get an abortion. Yeah. And then oh god, what are some? Of, is she like casually mentions that she can't have children? Yeah, that just shows up. To there weren't me. enough hot button issues in this movie already. Yeah. I'm really curious how this would have looked to somebody in 1964. I can't imagine, especially when you get right near the end and you hear like, I'm guessing a lot of detail about, uh, well, the molestation. Yeah, um, and I, I think that was handled honestly pretty well. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of really admirable parts of this movie. And there's also like paying somebody not to get an abortion, which is at threat of physical force, which is kind of weird. Yeah. Just just a little bit. Un peu. Yeah, but. It, it's, there's some serious manipulation going on there. It's emotional, physical, and monetary. Right. And then there's also, like, she, I'm kind of curious, right, because she's in the police station, and she's saying, like, the first time I kissed Grant, he did something, or there was a taste when he kissed me. When I was a prostitute, they called it a naked kiss, which obviously is the name of the film. Mm -hmm. And it was a sign they were a pervert. And I'm kind of curious if that was common slang in 1964, a naked kiss. Well, so we can look this up. I look, I look this up right now. I go to Google and say, what is a naked kiss? The first thing that showed up is the naked kiss the movie. Mm. Naked kiss the movie. What is most striking in the naked sand is a series of surreal scenes, da 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 da, da where the characters almost appear to step into another film altogether. Huh, yeah? Yeah, it, that sounds about right. Like, it's, you get the sense that Fuller had, like, a very restless mind, and he needed to kind of operate in these marginal, low-budget movies so that he could just sort of be freewheeling the way that his mind seemed to work. Like, I can't imagine him ever working well within the Hollywood studio system. Uh-huh. Oh, no. Yeah, not at all. Um, so the closest thing I found for Naked Kiss is Urban Dictionary, a cute phrase for sex. Example, let's go home for some naked kisses. Not a very uh, yeah. definition. We weren't looking for profound, though. I mean, um, maybe, actually, I have I have a bunch of slang dictionaries. Let me go get the Barnett slang dictionary. Okay. All right, so for those of you at home following along, I just walked into my kitchen and picked up two separate editions of Eric Partridge's A Dictionary of Slang in Unconventional English. One from the 1960s, so pretty close to when the movie came out. I think I'm going to use this one. The other one's from the 1990s. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Neck or Nothing, Neck Squeezer. I love this book. This is like one of the best bathroom readers ever made, but... Uh, we got going on here. H I J naked, naked as a cuckoo, naked as a needle, naked as a stone, naked as a shorn sheep, uh, naked truth. No, I think I think Samuel Fuller invented that. If it's not in a 1961, like the, I mean, this thing's the size of a phone book. Like, uh -huh. okay, and it's from like three years before the movie came out, so. Yeah, I'm going to just guess that that was an invention of the movie. As you were talking about that, I was also pulling up uh, articles about the movie, and this is, there's a lot of craze showered on this movie. Yeah, I mean, it's such an un, because, like, you think about other movies in 1964, I can't think of another movie, outside of, like, some French New Wave stuff, and the French New Wave guys, like, loved Samuel Fuller's movies. I think, like, Gadar particularly loved the fact that he would kind of seem to make, like, five different kinds of movies and call it one movie, because that was a thing that Gadar loves to do in, in a lot of his films, like Band of Outsiders, Starts out sort of like a noir, turns into a musical for five minutes because why not? Um, or like, uh, and I, well, Made in USA is is also kind of like that, but Pirola Fu, it's like five different genres of movie just held together by the fact that nobody else could have made it beside John Luc Godard. Mm -hmm. So I, I can see where he probably had this admiration for Fuller's kind of tonal freedom with his films. I mean, there's also like, in, and there's a lot of countercultural bona fides in this film that I don't think show up in a lot of movies prior to that point. 
What do you mean? Well, so we have the traditional vectors of respectability and propriety in society are all shown to be like the, the richest guy in town who's the most beloved person in town turns out to be a child molester who is probably running the orthopedic children's hospital specifically to like traffic children in some capacity. Mm-hmm. The, the only police officer in the town, we pretty much only see him like he's terrible at being a police officer because Kelly basically solves her own mystery for herself mm-hmm. to the point where Griff is like even having her question the victims or the quest- question witnesses, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the only other times we see him in the movie, he's picking up hookers. Mm-hmm. We're hanging out at the uh, the Bon Bon Saloon, I guess I'll call it. Um, and the only person who's actually like uh, on the level and wanting to do anything right is this reformed prostitute who, you know, reformed prostitutes were probably not looked upon with a lot of respect in, in U.S. society in 1964, from what I, I can gather from the historical record. <laughs> Um, Not hard to gather. Yeah. And and so you have like a lot of subversive ideas being thrown around. You have this inherent distrust of the rich. And I mean, especially with those Jeffrey Epstein documents coming out, the Grant thing seems like, I don't want to say prescient because like, you know, it's, it's not like there haven't been other rich child molesters in the history of, of the United States, much less the history of, of the human race. But at least in movies, this is the first time we see... It's like even Fritz Lang's M, like the guy is on the margins of society, the Peter Lorre character is the, the child molester murderer. And there is a direct visual quotation of M in this movie towards the end. You mean, uh, um, what do you mean? Uh, so when... Uh, when Kelly is in prison, or she's in the jail cell, and they're doing the the lineup of the kids for her to figure out which kid Grant was going to molest before she beat him to death with the... I can't get over... I, I still can't get over the fact she literally beats him to death with a fucking telephone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But the very first shot of that sequence, we just see children's legs walking in this like very intensely contrasted shadow against a wall, which is, I mean, it's been a long time since I saw M, but I'm like 99% sure that's part of the like 10 minute completely silent sequence um, where the, the kid gets murdered and you just see the, the balloon floating away. I'm pretty sure that exact shot um, shows, I mean, like he recreates the shot. It's not like he's just like using the actual footage from M, but he's very trying to frame his movie as being in this, uh, I guess, tradition of try. I mean, I think M is the only other movie I can think of that outright mentions child molestation up to that point. Uh And that was in like 1932 and and it was in Germany. And do they, and before the code, I don't know. I mean, I overstate, I I say the code, the code, the code a lot, especially um, my friend and I. The code wasn't applicable in Germany though. No, no, no. And it also wasn't around in the 30s. Um, Yeah, the pre-Hays Code, there's something in there that mentions that. What was that? Like the pre-Hays Code movies, like maybe there's a movie in there that mentions that because there's like thousands of those. And at least to my memory, it's M and then it's this movie. I don't know many movies from the era and I certainly don't know that particular, you know, topic in these movies of this era. But yeah, that's when that's when the the movie takes takes a turn, and it's suddenly a very different movie. I'm like, whoa, what the hell? Where did this come from? Because there's no indication beforehand that right there's anything amiss with this person. Yeah, beyond the fact that he he's like a bad actor. The guy playing Grant is a fucking horrible. Yeah, yeah, horrible actor. He's like the most, and I almost kind of wonder if that was intentional because he's supposed to be this like hollow sham and he's like not believable Uh but at the same time like the all the rest of the acting in this movie i think one of samuel fuller's greatest gifts as a writer is that he can write dialogue where you can tell someone is doing bad acting but it sounds like his dialogue sounds better delivered poorly if that makes any sense yeah like you, you try to imagine like more talented actors in this movie and i don't think it would be a i think it would be a worse movie <laughs> 
yeah, some of these some of these lines. I mean, there's some great lines in there, but but actually deliver it in in some in a straightforward movie. Yeah, they sound horrible. I mean, they already sound some of them sound kind of on a uh, out of place. What were some of the like bizarre lines? And uh, I'm trying to remember exactly. I mean, the Bon Bon thing, obviously. Um, there's like at least ten quotable like awful lines about Bon Bons. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And it's repeated, but they never, they, well, they never use the word prostitute until, until later on. Right. Or do they, do they yeah. use it later on? And like in the scene where we find out that Grant is a child molester, it's like not made very clear at all in the scene. Like Ron and I had to, Ron was like, Hey, do you want to like rewind a bit? And I was like, yeah, cause I have no idea what the fuck's going on. You know, she just like, it, yeah, I guess but it did we just dream like when the kid's walking out of the house that I just presumed it was like a transitional scene to something else. And that it was just something that she was imagining. Right. And then, of course, like she wasn't imagining it. We see Kelly's face get like, you know, she's she's clearly not happy. And then, you know, she she delivers the Arnold Schwarzenegger like line. There's someone on the line for you and then beats him to death. with a, No, she doesn't say that. <laughs> There's a call for you, Grant. Collect. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> So who's the audience nowadays? No, even then. Even who's then, the audience I mean, then and who's the audience now? I mean, I would say the audience, I mean, I feel like I'm part of the audience for this movie. This is, on the one hand, there's like a lot of substance going on. On the other hand, it's also like this perfect kitsch object in that it like somehow derives power and becomes more compelling the more it would seem by like traditional standards to be bad i guess like i guess anybody who who was looking for a, a very different experience at the movies because i don't think there were many other movies you could have gone to see in 1964 that would scratch the same itch this movie scratches Although people going in, well, I was going to say people going into it don't know what they're getting into, but that's not true. I mean, you know, people review movies. There's word of mouth. It's a hard movie to describe because you could like say everything that's going to happen and in, 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 like tonally, it's just for literally the first 50 minutes of the movie, every time we see the kids in the orthopedic hospital, for some reason they're wearing like, and this is supposed to take place over the course of months. They're all wearing pirate hats. Like, literally until the last 20 minutes of the movie or so, we do not see a child without a pirate hat on their head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Why? And Ron actually had a very good theory why. That there, that it was all, all those scenes were filmed on the same day, so they didn't want the kids taking the hats off because it was too much <laughs> trouble, like, getting them to put them on in the first place. And I mean, honestly, yeah, that sounds about in line with the rest of the film. The, the, the scene in which they're not wearing hats, they're... Well, you see the kids playing outside of the prison cell. You mm. mostly see just the one girl. So for that, there are no hats. Could also have been different kids. Yeah. And that's filmed on location. Hey, the <laughs> movie was mostly filmed on location, right? That's true of most like low budget movies. One of the one of the most valuable things in like B horror movies and stuff from the fifties uh -huh. is it's like this treasure trove of uh like photographic evidence of what the downtowns of small towns and places looked like. Oh, interesting. Because, you know, they wouldn't have the money to shoot on a studio back lot. So you're literally just getting documentary footage of like, what does this town look like in 1955 a lot of the time. So, so you can go and see it by looking at the, um, looking at bad movies yeah yeah and i mean I, I remember i had a really great conversation about that with uh my, my ex-girlfriend who grew up in the town i forget the name of the town but it, it's pretty much the only thing the town is known for is the steve mcqueen movie the blob was shot there oh really yeah and there's like where of the blob it creeps and like the the spiritual center of the town is just the diner that was used as the exterior of a diner in the blob and they rebranded themselves as the blob diner oh no kidding okay and yeah and it's it's also just like the only the only real footage of what the town looked like in the 60s outside of maybe like uh amateur photographs that were taken by you know, you know people that live there is any time that they show the downtown in the blob uh-huh 
So you can recreate the entire town based on the blob. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, probably, honestly. I mean, if, if there's a tracking shot, like, I mean, that town was like, there there was nothing. <laughs> except that diner. Except, oh, except the diner? Yeah, it was uh, somewhere around Pennsylvania, Quaker country. So, um, why is this movie um, considered by some people, like, phenomenal? I'm having a really hard time with this. I've been having a really hard time with a lot of the movies we've been watching recently. <laughs> I mean, this one I could probably answer better than with Nail and I, just because, like, I personally do like this movie. Uh Uh-huh. So, okay. At the same time, it's, I mean, I guess it's just, like, it's talking about a lot of things that no other movie was talking about at that point. If you're doing a purely intellectual analysis of it, it comes off pretty good. Um, you know, like the the themes and the overall arc of the film have aged much, much better than more prestigious films of the early 1960s. Uh, insofar as like, you know, the, the distrust of authority figures, the not pinning like pedophilia and stuff as being the province of like poor unwashed people, but being something that's hiding in plain sight and being done by the rich. Uh, the fact that the uh, the hero is like a fallen prostitute, which is like there's parts of this that feel like kind of like if Nicholas Ray wasn't good with a camera. <laughs> like there's a lot of Nicholas Ray vibes in here, but uh, obviously Ray was like exceptionally talented at dealing with actors, which I don't know. I mean, I feel like Samuel Fuller, he, he's exceptionally talented at, at like making the best of what he's got in front of him um wait sam fuller or nicholas ray uh sam fuller okay okay because I, I wouldn't say that he directed anybody to a great performance in this movie but it coheres this movie coheres i thought the opposite it or, or at least like every scene there's not a scene in this movie where i'm like bored or i'm thinking like why does this need to be here I mean, granted, it's also a very short film. It's only 90 minutes, so... So every every scene might have been enjoyable, and there might have even been something interesting about it. But part of what was so interesting was was how even even uneven the things were. Like, like different pieces would feel like they're part of a different movie. I mean, that's the whole thing. That last... It's not even the last third. It's the last 20 minutes. Well, yeah, 20 minutes out of an hour and a half movie in which it takes this sudden turn. Mm. And, it, and it really becomes a film noir. All of 20 minutes... <laughs> Right. She delivers like the, the ultimate, uh, that's pretty dirty Griff, even for a cop, which is like such classic, like noir, tough guy talk. Yeah. Uh, gal talk, as it may be in, in this case. And I don't know if it's language that would be used in a, well, let's say a good film noir. Mm. And it's the same language, except that it's done different. It, it comes across differently because of the because of the context and the way this movie is designed. But that'd be th- those lines would be lifted directly out of a good movie. But it, it just so depends on the context, the context of the rest of the film, the delivery, um, and so on. I don't know. I, I, I don't know enough film noir. I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to, like, if you're intellectually trying to dissect an older movie, this movie has, I mean, this is like a fucking playground. Like, everything that people would have wanted to talk about in an academic paper from the 70s to the present, there's something you could latch on to in here to talk about. And Fuller's overall attitudes are, like, remarkably progressive for 1964, especially for somebody who's, like, making Roger Corbett style like exploitation movies yeah 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 although one of the um let's see do i still have the article up oh no i got rid of the article i'm trying to remember who another exploitation uh uh filmmaker uh the article that i was looking at it was another exploitation filmmaker um on there i can't remember who yeah i mean like the closest thing i can think of was like monty hellman or something the guy who did cockfighter (laughs) did you ever see cockfighter no Oh, it's so good. It's like, it's not funny. It's like this dark drama about this guy who makes chickens fight. It, 
it's by um he, he's a he's a guy who did a two lane blacktop the one that's got james taylor and dennis wilson just like driving down the road for like 80 minutes okay it it, it feels like a european art movie but it also feels like early 70s like grindhouse shit uh-huh. and it tends to work on both levels although I, I feel like monty hellman doesn't have quite the same case of like adhd that sam <laughs> <laughs> um I mean, I think also, like, from a historical perspective, the the very disjointedness of the style, kind of, if, if you're trying to, like, find precedence to postmodern filmmaking or, like, pastiche cinema, um, or, or just, like, generally disjointed texts, because that became more of a, that became more of a thing after the 1950s, I want to say, like, making a movie that breaks down a genre boundary, whereas mm-hmm. before then... I think a lot of what made a great film a great film in the eyes of critics was like how much it exemplified or managed to reach some kind of platonic ideal of a given film genre. Uh Um, So, I mean, in terms of like breaking down genres, like I can't think of, I can't think of anything that, that like has quite this disjointed a tone before then besides maybe like breathless or, or some Godard movie, but those were made specifically to be avant-garde art, whereas Fuller was like, he was a guy who basically bluffed his way into a job at a newspaper, fought in World War II, um, and just sort of, he has no academic background, unlike Adar. Wait, is is that actually true? Yeah, yeah, he, he wrote a great autobiography. I never finished the whole thing because it's like really long, but the parts I, I did read, I enjoyed. Um, yeah, and, and, and his most famous film, The Big Red One from 1981 with Lee Marvin and uh, I forget who else. It's it's basically about his experiences in World War II. And also, I think his relationship to newspapers comes across very interestingly in this because the he has when the like, the inevitable like, oh, this is a film noir or, you know, this is a black and white movie. Some kind of narrative jump needs to be made through a newspaper headline being flashed on screen. He does, he doesn't show us an actual mock-up newspaper. He just like does the words one by (laughs) one over shots of people responding to it, Uh which I thought was really, especially given the fact that most of his like formal writing training was at newspapers. Oh, it was. Yeah, yeah, he was like 16 and he just got a job in a newspaper because newspapers, the idea of needing a degree to practice journalism is like pretty recent. Uh-huh. Um, most of the history in newspapers, it was just sort of like, you show up, you can do the job um, without a lot of formal training. It was it was seen as a lesser form of writing versus, you know, the kind of stuff you get at, you know, fine fine English literature, Shakespeare, Chaucer, uh, the kind of stuff you'd be studying at at a university. Are you willing to work really hard for only uh, two bits and a ham sandwich all week? Are you able to talk really fast? Oh my God, stop the presses, stop the presses. So you have to be able to talk like that. And yeah, that's pretty much Fuller did when he was 16. He went into a newspaper and he's like, I'm, 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 I can do that. You know, I, I, I can play Clark Gable and it happens one night. Talk quickly enough and I can get the answers. But I also think that that like gave him this interesting perspective on how society works because you you don't really see many other movies where it's like oh i mean i'm trying to think like the, like the closest movie i can think of where it's like oh there's a cabal of rich people that want to ruin everything or like the rich are secretly conspiring against the rest of us in terms of like commercial u.s movies like meet john doe by frank capra it turns out that he's like the uh, the gary cooper character is a media apparition created by the rich to control the poor Mm. Um, you, you ever see that one? Mm-mm. No. Oh, we should watch that at some point. That's like the best Frank Capra movie. What's it called again? Uh, Meet John Doe. Meet John Doe. Okay. Um, yeah, sometimes we should watch movies that are less questionable than others. <laughs> <laughs> we can make them questionable. Mm. Um, yeah. But yeah, I guess that's like a lot of it. Also, just the fact that it was such a like, it's one of those movies that feels strange enough where you feel this sense of, and, and also just it's not in the general canon to the point where like you can watch it and feel some kind of sense of ownership or like 
you're like part of a private club because you know this thing exists, which I think appeals to people a lot more than they'd like to admit when it comes to things like movies. I'm having a really hard time not dissecting this movie, but putting it together. I'm trying to do it now based on what you said about him working at um at a newspaper and see if that helps inform my understanding of the movie. I think so, because it would have put him in contact with more more parts of society than most people directing movies would have been in contact with. Um, I think like movie direction early on was kind of like journalism. It was just sort of like you show up, if you can do it, you can do it. If you can't, you just get kicked off to some other part of the production process. Uh-huh. Um, you know, like John Ford, John Ford pretty much grew up on movie sets. He was making, you know, and like John, John Ford had, had made a lot of great movies and everything, but you know, you don't get the sense of that, that he was, you know, he would have been directly interacting with prostitutes, philanthropists, or maybe, maybe philanthropists because he was a big name in Hollywood, but like, uh, I, I guess just not seeing, not having to stand back and look at society in a macroscopic level the way that being a beat reporter would force you to kind of see the, how the different aspects of society interact. Uh-huh. Mm. Um, I'm thinking of how he, uh, he buried the lead. <laughs> oh yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> he didn't know what the movie was about until the very end. I guess that's not all it was about, but we didn't know it was leading there. We had no hints. We had no clues. And it's like, wait, where did this come from? So it's like, you need to telegraph it. You need to let us know ahead of time or, get, you know, leave the different signposts. I don't know. Maybe I'm watching it a second time. All those signposts would be there. All those all those road signs. And I mean, I think it's, it's just a lot of like, oh, uh, God, who uh, I'm trying to remember his name. He's like a famous poet but like he he's famous for a, a book where he literally he he read out an entire issue of the new york times and then transcribed the recording of him trying to read the entire issue of the new york times out loud and it's like a 900 page book <laughs> oh wait no no he's pretty famous he got like he got into a bunch of hot water a couple of years ago because he made a, an art piece about Trayvon Martin where he just literally read the police report. Um, and uh, it's Kenneth something or other, but he, uh, he kind of said that art or poetry at least is about being faced with repetitive decisions and what decisions are made out of those or repetitive choices and then what decisions are made in regard to those repetitive choices. Um, and I think this film like is faced with a lot of genre tropes and always seems to end up taking a weird left turn regarding yeah. them. Yeah, it's definitely using tropes and I'm never sure like, wait, I think there's a trope here. I don't know if he's getting it right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's, it's it seems it seemed it didn't seem like he was you know messing around and playing around with tropes and the idea of the tropes and all. It was more like okay, let's grab this trope. Okay, this trope is part of the genre. Uh, okay, it's missing some pieces, but close enough. Right, and you can see how that would be so appealing to the French New Wave guys because it's sort of like he's using the entire rest of cinema as the shorthand to get across his point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's using no it as concern. shorthand. He's not bothering. What was that? He has like no concern for realism whatsoever. He's no. just sort of like trying to talk about the real world by taking bits and pieces of other movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what it feels like. And that's why it sometimes feels like it's a juvenile delinquent movies, or at least, you know, somewhere in that area. And sometimes, and then at sometimes it's a film noir. And at one point it's this re really low budget drama. Um, at one point- Right, it looks like a one, what, what they used to call a woman's picture, right? Like a feel good thing where a lady makes good and there's always like cute kids and she gets to prove her virtue by how great she is at taking care of the kids. Yeah, yeah. And we know that she's a wonderful person because we're told that multiple times. Mm. We would have seen more of when she when she rents the movie from 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 that older woman. Um, we probably would have seen more scenes with her. Um, we only saw a little bit early on, and it seems right. like just leading to Charlie. Um, let's see what other movies were there in here. Right, and there's a lot of shortcuts here because right because she shows up to the orthopedic hospital and they're like, "You're a, you we we can tell by your face that you're clearly great with children." And he yeah. even makes like a self referential nod to that later. Well, okay. 
I'm getting ahead of myself here. So she, we don't see her actually get the job at the orthopedic hospital, but when we hear about how she got the job, it's like, oh, she walked in and we just knew she was a natural at children. And she walks in to rent this apartment and the lady's like, the only reference I need is your face. Yeah, what the hell? And he does even reference that later in the script though, right? Because like, uh, what is it, Griff? goes up to her and says, you know, everybody's really thankful for what you did for the children by taking down Grant and his, like, child touching. Mm -hmm. And she says, people are really quick to build statues in this town. Yeah, yeah. And her leaving in a bus after that could even be, like, her rejection, could be taken as her rejection of... I guess sort of the the norms of society, right? Because like so much of the movie at the beginning is about her trying to fake it till she makes it to become normal. Right. And the more we see what quote unquote normal is, none of it looks normal. Yeah. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning the influence this probably had on Daniel Close's comic books. Who's that? Uh, the guy who drew Ghost World. Oh, okay. Also, okay. But also like Wilson and... Um, like a velvet glove cast in iron, you know, every issue of eight ball. Um, you David mentioned Sloan. a lot of move, a lot of graphic novels. You, you mentioned Ghost World, the guy who did Ghost World. You mentioned him enough times that when you mentioned him this time, I thought, Ghost World? Nah, nah. And that's why <laughs> I asked who it was. So like, wow, maybe next, what's his name again? Uh, Daniel Close. Okay, Daniel Close. I remember Daniel. And Close. if you ever saw the Ghost World movie or read the book, Yep. You might remember there's a character named Enid Coleslaw. Uh huh. Guess what that's an anagram of? Daniel Daniel Close. Okay. Close? Yeah. Uh yeah, C L O W E S. Um but yeah, Close is like obsessed with 60s trash culture and when the Criterion Collection released The Naked Kiss early on um, I can't remember I, I don't think the original release they I think the original release just has a black and white still of Constance Tower's face but when they reissued it on Blu-ray they had Daniel Close do the artwork and looking at this movie like there's so much stuff that he must have seen this at like a really young age because the whole scene with like the bald one woman beating the crap out of the guy in the beginning could have easily been out of like any early Daniel Close book. The ending of Ghost World where you have this really ambiguous scene of a woman going to a bus because she's learned something and we don't know where the bus is going or exactly why she's leaving for the bus um, very closely resembles the ending of this movie. Um, and yeah, that I, I guess just like, especially his like pre ghost world stuff where like, like the really surrealist stuff uh, there is a great graphic. I think the first graphic novel he ever did, which was called like a velvet glove cast in iron, which is just sort of like, he would get himself to the point where he was like in a fugue state because he was so sleepy, write down whatever he could think of and then draw it in the morning. Wow, cool. Yeah, it, it's one of the weirdest, like there's a guy who's not allergic to tomatoes. He's only allergic to ketchup. So he has like a ketchup dispenser spigot that was surgically inserted in his stomach. <laughs> the earth gets like so hot that people are like dropping any kind of money and then trying to pick it up with salad tongs and then burning themselves to death. Hmm. It's a really weird book. Um, I highly recommend it to anybody who who's into that sort of thing. But uh, and also he did all the advertising art for OK Soda along with uh, Charles Burns. Okay, wait, but that's the guy involved in this movie. You're saying that's that that was Daniel. That was, that was Daniel Close, the guy who did all oh, the Criterion oh, oh, oh. art for the 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 or the art for the Criterion release of this movie. He did the art for the Criterion release of this movie. Okay, so he had nothing to do with this movie. This was art that was created uh, for, uh, twenty years later, thirty years later. Yeah, I mean, Ghost World came out in the mid to late nineties, like a velvet glove cast and iron, I think came out in 1993. Um, but you can see like the influence of like sixties kind of kitsch culture all over his stuff in this like sinister feeling he manages to wring out of it. Mm -hmm. And it's all over this movie. And, you know, I can't think of a better person that they could have hired to do the, 
the box art for that because it's just sort of a it's just like a perfect fit i kind of wonder if he ever talked about it somewhere he he captures the 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 b-grade sinister uh feeling well yeah like that sense of like everything looks aggressively normal but everything feels like weirdly eerie yeah yeah but the b it's the b movie version of sinister right Right. I don't know what an A movie version of Sinister, or what would an A movie version of Sinister be? Well, I guess it, it's sort of like the the thing they want to be sinister is the thing that's being sinister, so like the villain or whatever. Like the most sinister parts, or the most sinister feeling parts of this movie are not the villains. It's like the weird tonal discontinuities. Like when, when Kelly is it like slaps the girl and is like, you're not getting that abortion. I'm giving you this money and I'm forcing you to go have the baby. <laughs> or, you know, any time they're talking about fucking bonbons, like... Wait, did, were they even trying early on to um, to make bonbons some kind of euphemism or from the start or some kind of... Well, bonbons was supposed to be like a shorthand for the prostitutes. Yeah, yeah. But I'm saying, was it... Was it... I, I don't remember. Was it clear from the start that like, yeah, bonbons with prostitutes, that's it. We're just using a different word until later. Or or was it kind of like, it's not euphemism. I think it was being used in a couple contexts, but the primary one I'm remembering is as like shorthand for like, oh, you like these bonbons? Try some of these bonbons, you know, like. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah. It, like, it wasn't code. It was hey, here's the exact euphemism we're going to use. Everyone, right, it was a substitution bonbon, code. Su- yeah, it's a substitution. Everyone, bonbons equals hooking. Right, and then, uh, oh God, the whole the whole pitch he gives with the champagne bottles, the, that whole scene is just like, I feel like this is a movie where you could cut any two minutes out of it out of context and have like deep web internet meme shit. Mm-hmm. especially in like because i'm sure the criterion dvd of this looks like 10 times better than the copy we ended up watching but i almost feel like the low quality of the video added to the vibe yeah yeah better quality would not uh i, I don't think it'd capture it. it would it would make it seem like a bad movie yeah it felt like i was finding it on a vhs tape unmarked in a box somewhere which is probably the ideal way to encounter this movie yeah right we, we won't yeah did, did you say how we actually watched it we, uh, watched, we watched it on youtube somebody put it it's in the public domain oh is it really public domain yeah it's public domain the copy that i own is part of a like public domain film noir one of those like five movies for 10 bucks collections oh i'm sure the criterion and that like the i'm sure the criterion version looks a hundred times better um, you can actually, you can copyright a film restoration, which seems kind of stupid, but it's also kind of good because otherwise there's no financial incentive to preserve these things in any decent looking form. And you just end up with crappier and crappier prints getting transferred to budget releases. Um, I don't know how long you should be allowed to hold the copyright on it though, but that's, that's why I like, uh, you know, Buster Keaton movies, you get the Kino versions, they're going to look great. Uh-huh. They're all technically in the public domain. You look up the stuff that's on archive.org and it looks like, you know, somebody took a dump on part of it. Or so. I think there's better <laughs> copies that finally are making the rounds, but yeah. All right. Any other thoughts about the movie and the sequel? Don't forget the sequel. Oh, what was the sequel? <laughs> no, I'm just making that up. Oh. <laughs> the very closed the hug. The clothed hug. No, that doesn't work well. <laughs> well, I think, okay, interesting side note. Um, number one, this has like meta shit in it because she walks by a movie theater early in the film when she's arriving into town and the movie being advertised on the marquee is the previous film that Samuel Fuller had written and directed called Shock Corridor. Oh, there's a book by her bedside that's written by him. Oh, is it, was there a book? There was a book by her bedside. Sorry, again, that was from that article. There was, mm-hmm. I guess he, so he's a novelist, right? Oh yeah, yeah, he, he wrote, he wrote a lot of different things. You know, he was a pretty prolific writer, I think, due to his background in journalism, because he was, if there's one thing that journalism's good at, it's, it's teaching you not to be precious about your writing. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there's, there's, there's a book of his uh, on, on the bedside or someplace. 
So he throws a lot of himself in there. Yeah, and there's like a lot of it's yeah, there's like all these kind of precursors to postmodern pastiche culture. At the same time, you don't really get the sense that he's not talking to you directly. Like he is speaking very directly about anything and everything that's on his mind. Mm-hmm. Um, or at least that's the the vibe that comes across. Whether it's coherent or not, that's Right. That's secondary. <laughs> like, this is on my mind, right? Ooh, this will fit. Ooh, let's put this one in there. What about this? Will it go back there? Not too late. Let's put it in here now. <laughs> right, really. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, she can't have children. Yeah. And, and I mean, that does lead to like the, the, the kind of like touching moment towards the end where she's walking out of town and she's just like looking at the baby carriage. Yeah, yeah. Like sort of the lost opportunity at normalcy. Mm-hmm. He almost, like posits this worldview that our entire idea of normalcy is just a performance done for children because you notice like everybody's like prostitute shaming but nobody's actually going after the brothel nobody's actually going out like the the police officer seems to think it's fine to pick up a hooker for 10 bucks when he's on or off duty because you don't know if he's on duty because he never wears a uniform yeah and the, the only thing that's like really a bridge too far is when grant breaks this and, and whenever she dreams about normalcy it's always in terms of children mm-hmm. although we, we we learn that being a prostitute isn't as bad as being a child molester i think that redeemed a lot of early earlier parts of the film that were a bit more confusing but that that is like an admirable moment where he's like trying to conflate her her, her prostitution activities with his child molestation we have to get married because you have a secret just like mine and she's like my secret doesn't like your secret buddy and then you know beats him to death with a telephone it took me a while to get used to the bad like how bad some of it was <laughs> And that was, okay, I'll go with the bad and laugh at it. And because in there, there's, in there, there's a lot of good. Yeah, it's, it's like not, if you're trying to learn the technical aspects of making a movie, like avoid this at all costs, because you're going to learn some bad habits. But, but I guess if you're looking for, if you're sick of the idea of like traditionally well-made movies and you're looking for something that's working on a different wavelength entirely, then this is essential. This learning about filmmaking from this would be like learning about um, uh, how to hold a camera from John Cassavetes. Right. (laughs) And Fuller is actually, he's cited as one of the sort of proto independent film guys because he did have a lot of control over his movies, which he only was able to get by making them at such low budgets and in such a marginalized distribution context. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but at the beginning it says like produced, written, directed by Samuel Fuller. Oh no, I didn't catch that. Yeah, he's like, he's doing it. It's a one man show. At the same time, he wasn't doing it. He did have producers. He did have money backers and stuff. And he was making stuff within genre context in a way that I don't think Cassavetes really was. Like the like shadows doesn't really line up with any of the established film genres of the time, really. Okay. Whereas this is it's a pastiche. Is it a is this would you say this is a pastiche of genres? Oh yeah, yeah. This is like the you know, you could use this in, in like a film course if you were if the kids were like like I don't know what a pastiche is, and it's like, well here, okay, watch watch this. Watch the big sleep and then watch this, and then you'll know what a fucking pastiche is. <laughs> hey, totally unrelated. Hmm. Today's George's birthday. Oh George so, uh, you know what tomorrow is. Tomorrow's your birthday. Yeah. You turn 31? I'm 31. 31. Wow. You're 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 an old man now. I'm officially over the hill. Um although in 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 gay world you would be um well you're one year away from 32. <laughs> Cuz gay ages go let's see if I get this right. Chicken, twink, 32, daddy, troll. Those are the Wait, ages. 32 is its own separate category amongst all the other things. Yeah. Chicken, twink, 32, Daddy Troll. Wow. 32 was a big birthday for me. Huh. Yeah, I, I guess amongst straight people, it's it's just like another way to tell that time has passed besides your hair falling out. <laughs> um. I'm looking it up now to see if I can find the joke. 
<laughs> Showing results for chicken 30, twink 32, daddy troll. I misspelled daddy. Um, oh, there, Rob Kirby on Twitter, my illustration for 11. Any idea who Rob Kirby comics are? No idea. Oh, okay. I found this in a bunch of places, These uh, the, the joke. Somebody called Rob Kirby, Rob Kirby comics. Um, illustration I did for a thoughtful commentary piece by Michael Eichler about gay male stereotypes called chicken twink 32, daddy troll. So would Monty and with Nail and I be, he would be a daddy or would he be a troll? Monty is, Monty is a troll. Okay. And both with Nail and I are, I guess that would make him twinks. Yeah, because they're not 32 yet. No. Yeah, yeah, they're they're twinks. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I they are. It had to do with like body shape more than age. It, well, I'm totally on the outside of all this. So, if you're if you're with that body shape and in your 20s, you're a twink. Oh wait, I think I was confusing twink and otter. Otter means you have some hair, and and you might be a little stouter, but you're not a bear. Otter is like a little bit of hair, but you're still fairly skinny. And then bear is like you you know there's there's like some to grab onto and there's a bunch of hair with a with an otter yeah there's there's a little bit of something to grab onto oh no no, but with a bear like a bear is just like or is bear just like a a thing that people think is like is a bear related to age or is that just like a matter of being fat and hairy uh it's more a matter of being fat and hairy okay Or, or at least somewhat overweight Let's see if I can find. I found a. Uh, uh, I found. A, I found a site that has these descriptions. I mean, there's so many. Breaking queer stereotypes by drinking, break, drinking his own body weight in in beer. Typically stockier and older than most gay men. Bear, well, most gay men. The stereotypical gay man. Bears are known to be aggressively hairy and alarmingly cheerful. If you are younger, you're probably a cub. Yeah. Whereas Otter is the antithesis to the twink, lean built with a sweater of scruff. He's laid back and lanky and loves things ironically. Wow, they really get into stuff that has nothing to do with it. I thought a twunk was a former twink. It is not. It is a twink slash hunk. A twunk is a twink on a protein-rich diet. It's more muscular than than a twink. Um, interesting. Okay. Well, I learned something new from these, you know, garbage articles. How did we get into twinks and twins? Oh, the ages, the ages. Yeah, because I'm a uh, birthday. But yeah, I guess with like straight people, it's just sort of like you're like legal and then you're like kind of old and then you're just like over the hill and then you're like, a creeper 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 there we go creeper by default i guess because you can be a creeper at any age but like there's a certain age where you're just sort of like nobody wants to think about you being sexually active Uh uh-huh i mean maybe that's that's wait what do you mean nobody (laughs) you're like they're interested in it hmm are they all alone and sex and, and and deprived of sex? I mean, supposedly people in nursing homes, like, they have a lot of sex. Yeah, yeah. Like, actually a huge, like, HIV transmission problem in nursing homes. Yeah, why should aging be a factor? Aging or looks? Well, when you're younger and you buy groceries, you know, you see there's a sell-by date. And you don't want to screw with the sell by date. So and what's I, the sell? What's the sell by date for an adult having sex? Oh man, um, it seems to get older the the older I get. You know, like when I first saw the Naked Kiss, I would have told you maybe like fifty six or something. But clearly, that was just me being me being a baby. <laughs> You know, I, I don't know, but, you know, I mean, anybody should be able to have any sex they want. I just don't want to, like, next time I walk into a Stewart's and see those hot dogs that have been, like, on the roller grill all day, uh-huh. I don't want to associate that in any way, shape, or form with, like, people's sexual activity mentally. I think most people don't want to associate old hot dogs with sex. Right. I mean, some people want a hot dog as part of their sexual activity and more power to them. <laughs> but I think most people don't. And when they see a hot dog, the first thing they don't, they don't first think of sex. Is a Nathan a thing in, in like gay slang? A Nathan? Yeah. No. Kosher style, however. <laughs> How about a Roy Rogers? Oh, yeah. To give someone a Roy Rogers, you take your middle finger instead of your index finger and yeah what about a bob's big boy (laughs) that's for size queens (laughs) oh and on on that very on that very serious note yeah very serious probably 
one size queens come up, you know you've said it all. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, anyway, this has been uh, Nominee Questionable Movies. Uh, I'm still Dan. And I'm still Ron. And we'll see you all next week. All right, take care, everyone.